are you all doing tonight? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. All right. Let's talk about sex. It's great to see you here. Um, we have the honor this evening of having James Wagoner, the president of Advocates for Youth, with us as our guest speaker. And he will be showing the film and talking with you about the issues that are introduced in the film. I'd like to begin this evening by thanking our sponsors. I'd like to thank the Collegiate Panhellenic Council, the Division of Student Affairs, the Department of Sociology, the Department of Anthropology, the Sociology Honor Society, AKD, Women and Gender Studies, the Committee on Lectures funded by the DSB, and the Gender and Relationships on Campus Club. James Wagner, a respected public policy and reproductive health expert, has been the president and executive director of Advocates for Youth since September 1997. He represents the organization with the media, funders, and colleague, colleague organizations, and during speaking engagements, both nationally and internationally. Before coming to Advocates, James spent seven years at NARO, the National Abortion and Reproductive Rights Action League, most recently as Executive Vice President. During the decade prior to that, James served on the staff of Senator Howard M. Metzenbaum from Ohio, who served on the Senate Budget Committee, the Labor and Human Resources Committee, and finally as Chief of Staff to the Senator. He is a graduate of Georgetown University, a father of four boys, and an avid baseball fan. James lives well and loves well with his wife, Lisa, Lisa in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, Advocates for Youth, just to tell you uh, briefly about the organization, was established in 1980 as the Center for Population Options. Advocates champions efforts to help young people make informed and responsible decisions about their reproductive and sexual health. Advocates believes it can best serve the field by boldly advocating for a more positive and realistic approach to adolescent sexual health. Let us welcome Mr. James Wagoner as our guest speaker this evening. Thank you very much, Teresa. And thank you for being here this evening. And my thanks, too, to all the um, organizations that have sponsored uh, this uh, event tonight um, and to the great student body here um, this evening. Um, I'm going to enjoy this because it's an opportunity for me to show this documentary film, Let's Talk About Sex, that we collaborated on uh, with the New York photographer and artist named James Houston. Um, the film takes an engaging and at times provocative look at sexual health in America and some of the reasons why we are lagging so far behind as a country compared to a lot of other uh, developed nations. In addition to looking at the lives of four young Americans, he goes across the pond and he goes to the Netherlands, a country with a markedly different and more open, honest approach to sexuality than we have here in the United States. And not to make some easy, facile claim that everything would be great if the US just became like the Netherlands. Um, no, rather to hold up a mirror, which oftentimes you can only get by looking at another society or another culture, a mirror to American culture, our approach to this, and maybe we can figure out a better way, make some course corrections. Ultimately, the film demonstrates that it's not simply about contraception, who has the best sex education, who has the best health system. It's about social norms. It's about the attitudes, the beliefs, the feelings that we have as individuals and as societies about sex. It starts there. It starts there. And then we get down to the policy stuff that I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. I hope that this film will provoke plenty of discussion and perhaps even some uh, vital, thoughtful disagreements. 
because this is a topic we should all be talking about a lot more with our friends, with our families, with our partners. Societies that are more open about it, that talk about it, do a lot better job of protecting the health and lives of their people when it comes to sexual health. Uh, but before offering uh, a snapshot of my own uh, views before this film, um, I want to also thank uh, Teresa and her students. Um, this is my second visit to your campus here. Um, and I come because of the work that's being done here in the relationship movement, talking more about relationships, right? We're going to talk about sex. We're also going to talk about relationships and the power of relationships to build uh, that experience and to make it far more uh, pleasurable for all involved, to make it far more human. Um, and I also come basically to learn uh, and observe, as well as to speak. And as you'll hear in my own remarks, make a few course, cor uh, course corrections um, of my own. But I want to commence my brief time with you here at the start, before the film, uh, with the following. Every day in America, 10,000 young people get an STD. Over 2,000 become pregnant. 25 contract HIV. This in one of the wealthiest, most educated, technologically advanced nations on Earth. Why is it? that the U.S. teen pregnancy rate is nine times that of the Netherlands, the HIV rate six times that of Germany, the teen chlamydia rate 20 times that of France. If we had the same teen pregnancy and birth rates as the Netherlands, we'd have 400,000 fewer teen pregnancies. We'd have about 65,000 fewer teen abortions. The federal government would save approximately $540 million in the first year savings alone. Attitudes, beliefs, norms translate into behavior. Behavior translate into outcomes. Outcomes translates into costs. Human relationship costs, social and economic costs, taxpayer costs, cost, cost, cost. It's all connected. How is it, though, that we have such disparate rates when the rates of sexual activity are roughly the same between these countries. Why the, why the dramatically different public health outcomes? How can it be that for a decade the official sex education policy in the United States was abstinence only until marriage in a country, this country, where 95% of the citizens have sex prior to marriage? How can the U.S. have 600,000 teen pregnancies one in four teen girls with an STD, and at the same time prohibit 70% of school-based health centers from making condoms or birth control available. How can it be that television networks provide space to advertisers who use sex to sell everything from laptops to Levi's and parade male erectile dysfunction ads ad nauseum, but ban condom advertising on network TV during prime time because it's too controversial. Are these really issues that can be addressed with more resources, better policies, science-based programs, or do they represent something different, something deeper, something embedded in our cultural norms, cultural norms in this society that are deeply, deeply conflicted? with fear, shame, and denial, competing with and often undermining education, communication, well-being, and basic common sense. I believe there are four fundamental myths that about teens and sexuality in America that underpin this dysfunction. Four myths that help us get in our own way in trying to become a sexually healthy culture, a sexually healthy society. Myth number one is the view that prevention is a threat, something to be feared, rather than a solution. The underlying belief that if we talk about sexuality, if we inform and educate young people about sexuality, if we develop pragmatic, evidence-based programs and policies to address sexual behavior in our culture 
we will encourage promiscuity. Educating and informing young people about sex causes them to have sex, right? Just like umbrellas cause rain. The second myth is rooted in good, old-fashioned denial. Denial that young people are having sex and that it is realistic to promote abstinence only until marriage programs that prohibit information about condoms and birth control in the era of AIDS. In the U.S., 70% of young people have had sex by the age of 19. Translates to about 8 million teens. The average age of puberty is now 12 to 13 in this country. The average age of marriage is between 26 and 28. Two weeks ago, in Congress, the House of Representatives introduced a proposal to cut an evidence-based teen pregnancy prevention initiative that required science and evidence of effectiveness. They were going to cut it by $80 million, take the science and evidence uh, requirement out, and turn it into an abstinence-only until marriage program. Memo to Washington. Denial is not an effective national strategy for sex education in America. The third myth underpinning our cultural norms is that young people and advocates, we work with ages 15 through 25, right? So the cultural norm or myth in this country that young people, they're just hormonally driven accidents waiting to happen, right? Nothing but a bunch of hormones. Can't think, can't feel, just driven by all the plumbing, right? That's all what it's about, right? I've got four boys. And as my 19-year-old told me when he was 11, I'm young, I'm not stupid. I don't think anybody responds well to a message, to an approach, to an educational system that doesn't treat you with respect, that doesn't look to your life, to your experience, as having any meaning at all, to lecture rather than listen, to impose rather than dialogue. That's not the way you're going to get very far. And if people don't respect, in my view, young people in this country, be it parents or policymakers or educators, we are never, ever going to reach our educational standard up, become a sexually healthy and literate nation. <laughs> Myth number four. It's a cycle of stigma we attach to sexuality itself, right? We externalize sexuality as a threat something negative outside of ourselves, an opponent, an adversarial force with which we have to fight and grapple. The implications of this are significant. If our human sexuality is somehow negative, contaminated, and toxic, then feelings of shame, fear, and denial are natural corollaries. And in turn, these feelings undermine communication, education, and basic feelings of self-worth. It's like the humorist's caricature of the anti-sex approach and abstinence only until marriage program. Sex is dirty, filthy, and disgusting. Save it for somebody you love. Okay, that wraps up the myths. Now, some recommendations that I think would put us on a path towards a sexually healthy America. Number one, we've got to engage young people from 15 on, even earlier, Adults who are interested in forming educational programs that are interested in shifting the way we think and act around sexuality in this country, we've got to engage young people, not just as problems, but as partners, as leaders, not followers, as innovators, not passive beneficiaries of our adult policies and programs. Respect your audience. Why put young people at the center of our vision, program, and policy work? Because the millennial generation, and you're part of it, those born after 1982 are the most pro-sexual health generation in U.S. history. Whether the issue is sex education, equal marriage rights, access to birth control, reproductive health care for women, this generation is more supportive, more open, more committed to change than any other age cohort in this nation. In many ways, yours is a generation people like me have been waiting for. The issue, irrespective of the issue, there's the biggest generation gap in U.S. history on attitudes around sexual health. In addition, young people, your generation, are at the epicenter of cultural change driven by te technology. 
It's your style, music, connection, taste, norms, dress that are propelling cultural change in America. Look, for me, technology's always going to be a tool, right? When I was year eight, I, I wrote on a yellow pad. Now I got a computer. Not, not much difference. That's the way I connect to it. Your generation, in many ways, views technology as culture, as connection. The degree to which your generation has internalized technology puts you in the driver's seat. And the pace of cultural change in America now is dizzy, driven by technology. It took television. I mean, I'm old enough to remember the first color television. Sitting up when my dad got in at 11 o'clock at night to watch the Johnny Carson show in color, right? It took television, the invention of television, 15 years to get 50 million viewers. 15 years to get 50 million viewers. It took the internet five. It took YouTube two. The third reason your generation is looming so important in this whole area of sexual health is that you're accumulating more political power earlier than any other generation. I've worked in electoral politics when I was in the Senate. I worked on presidential races. I, looked, I worked on Senate races. And we never thought about young people. Young people don't vote. Norm, seniors, seniors, 60 up. That's the golden group. That's the group that turns out the vote. That's who politicians pay attention to because they vote. In 2008, that changed. 18 through 29, for the first time in U.S. history, was a bigger share of the population than seniors. First time in history. Every time you go to the polls, whoever you vote for, Democrat, Republican, Independent, that's not what's important. What's, what's most important, what's most important is that you vote. Every time you do, you strengthen the power of your generation. You make it impossible for politicians in Washington not to listen to you. And you are doing that at a rate that's never been done before. For all these reasons, I think we've got to engage your generation, those younger than you, your age and a little older, as partners in our work. That means for people like me who run organizations dedicated to this, we not only have to share tasks, we have to share power. We don't dictate, we engage on the front end, not on the back end. Engage youth in the design, implementation, and evaluation of our policies, our programs, and our ideas. My second recommendation is that we embrace the science and evidence of what works to reduce teen pregnancy, reduce HIV, reduce STDs. We need to become radical pragmatists. Radical pragmatists, allocating scarce resources to the most proven effective programs. Our track record on this has not been great. For over a decade, as I mentioned earlier, the official government policy in this country was abstinence only until marriage, programs that censored information about condoms and birth control. We spent $1.5 billion on these programs over the decade. Despite a fact, the fact that a 10-year evaluation mandated by, a congr by Congress determined that the programs had no impact on teen behavior. Despite the fact that every leading credible public health organization in the country supports age-appropriate, comprehensive sex education in America, education that includes information about delaying sex, includes information about abstinence, but also includes information about prevention about condoms and birth control. Listen to this list. The American Medical Association, the Academy of Pediatrics, the Society of Adolescent Medicine, the American School Health Association. Every one of those organizations supports comprehensive sex education, but the politicians didn't care because it wasn't about science, it wasn't about facts, it wasn't about prevention, it was about ideology. And now is the time to realize that with over 8 million teens who have already had sex, America cannot afford to stick its head in the sand. It cannot afford not to educate young people about prevention. And I believe that in addition to taking an evidence-based pragmatic approach to prevention, we need to support the rights of young people to complete accurate information about their sexual health. There's a whole lot of difference between a public health attitude that says you have a need 
for information or access to services. If you have a need and I'm the expert, I'll decide how that need's going to be met. I'll tell you what you need. I'll tell you where to go. I'll tell you about that. If it's a right, if it's a right, that's going to be a dialogue. It's going to be a dialogue. You have a right to the information. You have a right to the access to the services. And in the end, rights is about agency. It's about power. It's about owning your own sexuality to feel comfortable and sure about who you are as a human being. To feel the strength to ward off and reject unwelcome pressures to have sex. To push back and resist emotional exploitation. To report incidents of physical intimidation and abuse. And yes, the power and the knowledge and the confidence to engage in a loving relationship. But you've got to know a lot about yourself. You have to feel a lot of agency around your own sexuality to have that strength. And that comes from rights. And that's why rights are so important. In the end, I believe firmly that information and education are kind of the cornerstones for any individual taking personal responsibility for important life decisions. That's where it comes from. Following upon this recommendation is my recommendation that we place a much bigger emphasis on relationships in our education efforts, our families, our communities, including our faith communities. We often think that sexuality is all about the plumbing. Sexuality is all about the sex part. It isn't just about the sex part. Relationships are critical to young people, to all of us, as we develop over time. And in my view, we don't do a good job in our culture of building relationship skills, communication, empathy, the balance between compromise and assertiveness, how to actualize and operationalize core values of personal integrity, respect, honesty, and the sort of courage it takes to be yourself and not a follower in a crowd, to do what you want to do, to do what you think is right. That's courage. That's courage. How to recognize the signs of a bad relationship and the hallmarks of a good relationship. And personally, I think we should be working towards a culture that prizes relationship-based sexual intimacy. I believe it offers our best opportunity to integrate the emotional, physical, spiritual, and ethical dimensions of our sexuality the best opportunity to become a sexually healthy being. My last recommendation tracks back to the myths and negative attitudes that I talked about uh, that at the beginning and that, that are holding back our progress towards a sexually healthy nation. I believe we must develop a new form of advocacy. Okay? We're used to advocating for bills or changes in school boards or stuff like that, but I'm arguing for a new form of advocacy, cultural advocacy to go along with the policy and program uh, advocacy. We must actively engage the negative norms surrounding sexual health as they surface in books, films, television, the blogosphere, and yes, on Capitol Hill. Challenge the networks for refusing condom ads. Challenge the fashion designer using an emaciated female image to push his product line. Challenge the Lord of the Flies mentality that thinks cyberbullying is just an, another cool Facebook application and in the process drives a young gay man to suicide. Challenge the segment of hip-hop music that demeans women and commodifies sex and the rock star interviewed in Esquire who talks about trophy sex and promotes homophobia. I love John Mayer's music, but dude, get a life. You know, to give that kind of trash talk and interview, get a life. And that's cultural advocacy. We carpet bombed his Facebook page, saying just that. Get a life. We don't want to hear this. We don't want to hear the trash. Good music. Kill the trash. Challenge the senator. The senator who walked down on the Senate floor and lectured his fellow senators and everybody in the gallery for two hours on virginity and abstinence, and the value of abstinence only in two marriage programs, and two weeks later showed up in the call book of the DC Medet. This is a sort of cultural hypocrisy, a sort of cultural myths and misbehaviors that we need to call out as advocates to change 
the way we're headed. And before we start the film, I just want to close with sort of a snapshot, a quick, what I call kind of a vision scape. In other words, okay, a sexually healthy America. We know we're not there. We know we've got a lot of work to do to get there. But what would it look like? What would it look like? In my view, it's a society where sexuality is viewed as a normal, natural, positive aspect of being human, of being alive, rather than as forbidden fruit locked away in a tower of fear, shame, and denial, where young people are viewed as assets, not deficits, as part of the solution, not part of the problem, where sexual health rights are properly balanced with sexual health responsibility, and everybody has access to the information and services that they need, where policy, public policy, is based on science and evidence rather than politics and ideology masquerading as public health. And finally, where values, faith, and character are used to infuse sexuality with its truly human and most ethical dimension and never misused to deny young people the information and education that could one day save their lives. Well, now you've heard from me. Let's hear from Mr. Houston, and let's talk about sex. Okay, um, I would like for my Social 219 students to stay. Okay, I'm going to uh, just give you a little assignment to watch products for coming and staying for the whole program. So. Just do some quick, quick react. Did anybody just give me something you liked about it? Maybe something you didn't like about it. Something positive. Something in the back of the room. I love it. Um, I wish that I'm, I'm not a student. <laughs> I'm a former student at the university, but I'm currently a community sexual health educator, and I work um, for youth and health services here in the historic county of Texas. And I have my lovely daughter with me here today. <laughs>
sexual health in America. Uh, we are not a sexually healthy nation. And I think the parents want their kids to have the information. I think the parents want to do a better job talking about values and interests. But it's hard. That sex education is a literature. I mean, you know, I remember when I was a kid, my dad would give me a haircut and said, if you have some thoughts, something you've had, someone be good, and if you have questions, talk to your mom. about what is the intersection between sexual intimacy and relationships. I think that's a big conversation that needs to be had in a much more open, smart way at, at college campuses and in America. 12 to 13 is the average age of puberty. 26 to 28 is the average age of marriage. What are the cultural rules of the world? We know that abstinence only until marriage doesn't work because 95% of the people have sex before marriage. But what comes, it's not like, okay, that's gone. Now what's in its place, right? What's a healthy model as a society? We're never going to agree 100%. This is intimate behavior. We're 300 million people. But there's got to be some broad social consensus around healthy approaches to sexuality if the culture as a whole is going to get right. So I think that's the dialogue that's most important right now. What is the intersection between responsible sexual pleasure and relationships? I mean, pleasure is why people have sex. It seems like that should be part of the conversation. Pleasure and relationships. What's that? What's that dialogue? What's that? So that's an important problem. One last time.
because there's something in human nature that thrives on connection. And I think many of the reasons that we avoid, you know, relationships at some point in sex is if you're not in a relationship, you can't sex. Maybe you're kind of protecting yourself to some degree. Less chance of getting hurt, less chance of getting, you know, somebody walking away. That hurts. You know, all that kind of confusing emotional growth that we go through as human beings. I just say talking about it, having dialogue about it. Um, I'd like to see it surface more in cinema and film and plays to really tease this out in sort of interesting, provocative ways that aren't boring, the lecture talk magic, you know, that's more in the culture, in the music, raising these things in a way that we listen to them because it's relevant to my day to day life. You know? So that would be my point of view, coming back to the change consciousness and the great change. Are just people talking about the subject in interesting, new, and dynamic ways. But not a lecturing way. You're wrong, and you're right. I'm right, and I got the only way. That's what this is about. This is about, let's, let's figure this out. Start puberty at 12 or 13, average age of marriage 26 or 28. What are we doing in between? All right? We have just a good conversation. Well, terrific. Thank you all for your time tonight. Uh,